welcome to episode two of Wargame Basic Training for Empire of the Sun. If you're new here, go and watch episode one where we go through the anatomy of a card. Uh, today we're going to talk about the anatomy of a counter. Uh, we're going to go through mostly the combat units and HQs in this one. But what we are going to do is we'll just um, go through some tips and tricks before we even get to that stage as well. So the game, this is all the counters for the game. Um, there's a, a number of administrative counters, different flags for control, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that literally say on there what you do with them. They're actually fairly self-explanatory once you've read the rules. It's, this is just a marker for whatever it is, and those go on a strategic record track where you just, I have this many amphibious shipping points. It's just a marker for those. There's a lot of what that is. However, you can do yourself a favor with this game because the game is only 12 turns long at most. Um, and most games, frankly, won't go that long, or they'll be much shorter, either due to doing a smaller tournament scenario, or you're going to concede one way or the other, and you don't need to play it out. So, what you can do is you can organize your counters chronologically based on if they start on the board, or in which turn they come on as reinforcements. And what that does is that helps to aid the play of the game. So you're not rifling through looking for units, when you have them already set up, kind of half set up, in this GMT counter tree. Um, so, these first three boxes here, these are all units that start on the board. They have a four digit number that references a hex, and they start on the board at the beginning of the game. And then in this box I've got units for turn two, I've got units for turn three, four, five, six, seven, and then uh, I think this is 8, 9, and then it's 10, 11, 12. Because th there's, first, first off, you hardly ever get to the end of the game. And second off, if you do, there's so few, I just kind of got them chucked in there. But if you organize them this way, when you get to a new turn, you're not rifling through a pile of blue counters to fish out the ones you need, or a pile of brown counters to find those ones. I've got it all set up. All right, it's the, it's the beginning of a new turn. Here you go, these are the ones I can't. Your ones, you get to put them out. I'm going to roll for my uh, delayed reinforcements and stuff. It's really simple. This is just one of those little hacks that will help you get the game played instead of being, you know, intimidated by all the units. So, let's look at some of the units that we've got because there are a number um, and there's a whole bunch of different types and, and lots of things to consider. So, the first thing we'll do, we'll get out... This is a Japanese cruiser unit. And we'll get out a Japanese aircraft carrier unit. And we've got UK Commonwealth unit, Japanese army, and let's get some aircraft. We got some Dutch East Indies troops. We have an HQ, that'll be fancy. And let's get out this one as well. And a different HQ. And let's get some American units. They got blue ones and green ones. And we'll get a, a little. Uh, we have some. Okay, let's get some air units, more air units out, because those are very important. Okay, so we have here uh, a big mix of different types of counters. So. The first thing to note, and we'll kind of organize these accordingly, uh, are kind of the colors. So basically, the white and yellow ones are the Imperial Japanese forces. The white ones are the Imperial Japanese Navy, and the yellow ones are the Imperial Japanese Army. The distinction between those two um, service arms is very important, because um, historically, the, uh, the leaders of those military powers did not always agree on doctrine and tactics and all that kind of stuff. And so there's a whole mechanic called inter-service rivalry, where if you are currently suffering from that as the Japanese player, you can't use yellow and white units combined in an offensive. And that can be a significant hamstring if that's foisted upon you by the Allied player. If you're not in inter-service rivalry, no big deal. You can mix and match any units you want when you create a task force to go out and do an attack, for example. 
the uh, for the allied forces, they're not really they don't have those kind of limitations as such. Although some cards will say activate only U.S. Army or you must have one U.S. Navy and one U.S. Army unit at least that kind of thing. But we've got blue is the U.S. Navy, green is U.S. Army. This one's obviously U.S. Army Air Force. Then we have these orange units, and there's a bunch of these to start with. These are kind of the local dusty Dutch East Indies. Um, Kind of, they're more like local police forces more than anything. They're not particularly strong combat wise, uh, but you've set up, there's like a whole swathe of them across the DEI, and that's something that the Japanese player has to, has to kind of root those out at the beginning of the game. But th once they're gone, those don't really come back. Uh, and then we also have these kind of brown ones here, and there's a couple here. These represent Commonwealth forces, a lot of it's Indian divisions or Anzac divisions. Uh, and then a lot of Royal Naval units as well. Um, the last thing that we've got here are these two little HQs. We've got a little yellow one for the Japanese and a kind of a turquoisey one for, for the US. We'll get to the HQs a little bit later and talk about what some of those numbers are. To start with, we'll just look at some of these counters. Now, the ground units, they use um, what's commonly referred to as NATO symbols. If you've played any war games, you'll probably be familiar with these. So the symbol on this one here is this big rectangular box with one X across it. And that re that what that means is there's a an infantry unit. Um, and they vary in size. Sometimes it's a single division. Sometimes you get to like full like army size units and you can tell not only because of the tiny little X's, this one has one X above the symbol, this one has four X's, those denote the size, but you can also kind of see based on the combat strength, right? It says it, this has an 18 and a 12, those are much bigger than four and six, right? Generally speaking, bigger numbers means more powerful units in these games. And that also applies here. Uh, the other thing that we'll note, and that part of this is to do with the setup, is every single one of these has a little somewhere in the top left has a four digit number on it. So this one's 4017, 3607, 2014, etc. That references the setup hex. And again, when you're punching your units, the first time you've ever played, pay attention to those. Anything that's got a four digit number on it, keep those separately. Because it'll make setting up this game so much easier. Um, some of them, so for example, this guy here, we got the uh, 25th Army down here. These guys don't have a four digit number on them, but they have this tiny little white triangle on the corner, and that's an indication to flip it over. And here you can see the four digit number. This unit starts on its reduced side, and the reduced side is a weaker combat strength. It went from an 18 to a 9, so they're not as combat effective. And this represents um, fighting that they were involved in before the game. They're, they're under strength either from taking losses or they haven't reached their supplies yet. They haven't reinforced properly. Lots of different things go into that. And that's one other thing to consider is most of the units in this game are dual-sided. So this one flips over, this one flips over, this one flips over. There are some that, that don't flip over. So, for example, these Dutch East Indies ones, you flip it over. Oh, it, it, it does have a side. Well, my bad. I just lied to you. I swear there's some that don't. Here we go. This little this little guy down here. He's real weak. He's your little local, local forces. He's This is like, I think, a company. I mean, it's like a hundred dudes. You flip it over, It's there's nothing there. If he takes a wound, he's removed from the game. Normally... If you have to take hits, you just flip over, and then you can fight. Uh, and if you take that second hit, then you're removed from the game. There we go. So, that's kind of how, you know, each you can kind of, if you want to be reductive, you think about it as kind of hit points, so to speak. Uh, you have two steps, then you're eliminated. So, the other thing that we're going to look at, so we have those NATO symbols, then we have infantry ones. Um, these guys, these have that little anchor symbol on. That means that these are, are Marines. This is the third special, I think they're like special naval task force or something. I can't remember. They have a, a, a Japanese name, but they're basically special naval landing forces. They're, they're Japanese Marines, basically. 
Um, but I think those are the core. You don't get a lot of other types of crowd units in this game. There is a few, um, what, I mean, one or two British armored divisions uh, where they have tanks. They have like an oval symbol on them. Um, but the ground units are the only ones that use those NATO symbols. Everything else has a silhouette on it. So you can see this is a this is a Japanese carrier, and you can see it's got a kind of flat top silhouette on it. The Japanese cruiser got a symbol of a cruiser. This is a British battleship uh, that has a battleship silhouette on it, and then a, and then a U.S. cruiser down there as well. Uh, and then we've got air units. So we've got this small these are small single engine fighters. You got little zeros on there. And then we got larger um, U.S. Air Forces, like Mitchell-type bombers on there. They're not as effective for some things, but they work well, 7th Air Force. Most things have, have pictures on them, just to help you easily identify what they are. Okay. So now we've gone through kind of the pictures and what they are. We're going to look at these numbers on them. So numbers are what you're really going to be considering when you're creating task forces and looking at where to attack and what to attack with. So, what we'll do is we'll start with the, uh, with the, with the ground units. So the ground units have only two numbers on them. The first number is their, basically their attack strength. And then the second number, in this case, a 12, that's their, I'm going to call it a wound threshold. Is a way is a way to think of it. So, for example, in a straight up attack, if he attacked him, you would do eighteen points of damage to him. Because eighteen exceeds this twelve, he would get flipped over. You subtract twelve from your eighteen, and you have six points left. Six isn't equal to or greater than twelve, so those last six are wasted. And that's kind of how you have to think of this. And when you start getting into um, different sized units or smaller units, or when you start combining forces, so if these two guys attack together, you're looking at 36 points of damage, that's going to wipe 12 points of, off of here, flip over, and it's going to wipe those 12 points, and then we've still got points to spare. So that's that's basically how the attack factors and those loss factors work. You have to, you basically, when you do an attack, you combine all your attack factors, and some of those get pretty wild, and they do get modified by a dice, but, uh, you know, you might end up with 30 or 40 attack factors attacking another stack, and then you have to take losses, and you can look through your units and say, I'll take 10 points here, I'll take 6 points here, and I'll take another 10 points there. And then, and then the excess is wasted, basically. That's that's how the combat and taking losses works in this. It's quite different, in a way, from other games where you just do X number of hits based on your die roll. Uh, here, you your your die roll modifies your combat strength, and you have to take that full combat strength's worth of losses equal to the, whatever increments you've got in units. So again your unit and force composition is quite important in that sense. Um, the major, the only other major thing is you can see with these air naval units, and what we're looking at is air units and naval units with an air capability, a cruiser, these guys have a third number on it, and it's and it's a like a little kind of a range. So if you think about it, these units uh, are more mobile or have the capacity to extend their influence beyond where they normally would. You know, ground units, a ground unit, that's where it is. Whereas this aircraft carrier, sure, the aircraft carrier is located here in this port, but its airplanes can fly three hexes away and fight in a combat in this hex, for example. And that's what that uh, that's what that range means, basically. Same thing. I've got a, I've got this little air unit here. He's got a three range. He can join a fight over here or over here or anywhere in between, basically. And and it's neat because this guy he's really strong in attack. He's got a twenty attack factor, but he's a little bit shorter range because they're little short range fighters. These big bombers have much larger fuel tanks, but they're less powerful uh, in attack. Um, 
but that's how those work. Um, there's, you know, it's it's that's not a particularly complex um, concept. But when you start getting things added up and all this other kind of stuff, I, I can understand how it snowballs. So those are basically the units. Uh, the ground units do not have a move factor printed on them because their move factor, I believe, is always one. It's one. It is just one. Which means if you play a card with a one value and you want to activate this guy, he moves one space. Now, if you have a card that has a three value on it, that three acts as a multiplier for their inherent uh, movement value. So he would move his one space three times. One, one, one. And all of that is printed down here at the bottom of the map. So air units have uh, much higher movement factors depending on um, the kind of movements that they are. So for example, this dude has his little... Oh, you can't see that because I moved it because I'm a moron. All right. So this guy, he's got his little two value for each movement each movement point, basically, he can move two hexes. So if you play a three-value card, he does his movement three times. So he can move two hexes, then he can move two hexes, and then he can move two hexes. Obviously, you have to control, at the beginning of your turn, all of those airfields to do that, but he can do that. For the naval units, this guy has a, has a movement of five. Again, these are in, basically inherent values, in a lot of these. If you've got naval move naval units, they can move five spaces they're sailing. So for a three if you play a three value card, you multiply that. Five by three, you can move fifteen spaces. So you can start swinging your naval assets way far away, doing really tricky bits and pieces, which is really fun. Uh, the last thing on the uh, these units that you'll notice is that the uh, just above this little two movement value, there's a small differently colored number. This one has a red 4, this one has a white 4, this one has a red 5. That's its extended range. Basically, if you drop all of your weapons and you add drop fuel tanks, you can fly further. But you're basically combat ineffective or you can't contribute in combats depending on the situation that you're in. Um, but if you want to if you want to basically do strategic move when you're just like, I just want to fly them really far, you can do that uh, within the bounds of your extended range, you're just much less effective in combat if you're doing that to get into a fight at, uh, at the end some way. Okay, so that's the combat units. The last thing that we'll take a look at here today uh, is the HQ units, because there's a bunch of those on those start on the board. Now the HQ units have a name, so this is Combined Fleet HQ, this is CPAC or Central Pacific HQ. Again, they have a four-digit setup on it, and they have two numbers. The first, this one's a 13, this one's a very effective 25. This is their range. That's their command range. That's how many hexes. So this guy can influence and command anyone that's within 25 hex radius. So that's really, really good. This guy, he can command anyone who's within a 13 hex radius. Not nearly as strong as that, but for the Japanese, a lot of their stuff's focused over on one side of the map anyway, so it's still very effective. The second number in this red box, this is their efficiency value. Basically, if you play a card, you can activate a number of units based on that card's value, but what you do is you activate an HQ with it. So, for example, if I played a three-value card and I chose to activate CPAC, I've got three units from the card, and I've also got a bonus three units from CPAC, because he's really good at command, he's their central command. If I was going to activate, for example, Southwest Pacific Command, my range isn't as good, and I can only get two bonus units. And some of that gets important uh, based on the, 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 the timing of where and when you want to do your attacks, but here's, for example, South Seas HQ that starts out in, like, I think that starts out in truck, I believe. But, uh, you know, the ranges, and I can, the, I can tell you this, the difference between 13 range and 12 range is the difference that you might need to, to make one attack. It, it, some things get, like, it's a game of inches, this is a game of hexes. 
which is cliched, I know, but but uh, that's that's really all the HQs are. The, the HQs are not complicated. You, it's your value on your card, or whatever your logistics value is, and you get bonus units you can activate with these, plus it's within the range band of that HQ. Um, if you're ever activating in reaction, this is the number of units that you can typically react into things, um, because reactions, it, it, you might guess it's reactionary, it's difficult to mobilize larger forces, so you're not getting like X number of units, you, it's whatever you can muster based on uh, the strength uh, of, the, uh, of the value based on your HQ. But that's the units. Honestly, that's the units. There's a lot of them. It can seem a little bit intimidating. There's a whole number of other extra admin counters, but again, those are just like for tracking what you're doing. So you've got a war in Europe track, you've got political will track, all these other tracks, those are just those. The combat units are the real core of this game, and the numbers are slightly less than traditional compared to other Hex Encounter war games where you have attack, defense, move. This was not quite like that, because a lot of the movement factors, A, they're printed on the board, but B, they're inherent. You just move one space with the ground unit, based on the scale of the map. You don't need to print a one on every counter, because that one is also going to be modified based on, for example, the card that you play. So, that's that's the core of the units. Hopefully that was helpful, and I've waffled a bit more than I probably should have done, but... That's an introduction to the units. Again, do yourself a favor when you're punching this game. Organize it as you punch. Look for all the starting ones that have the four digit in the top left. Keep those all in, a, in one baggie or in a couple slots in your tray. Then look for all the ones that have a two, three, four, five. Because, uh, seriously, you set up the game with these three on the board. When it comes to turn two, I just fish these out. You get half of them, I get half of them. And, and it's, I'm not, at so many games where setup either takes an age, because I'm looking through, organizing them all beforehand, which is also a bear, or I'm rifling through them in between turns, which slows the pace of the game down to a, a crawl. So, organize them like this, if you're so inclined, to me, makes a huge big difference. So, anyway, Anatomy of Counters, hopefully that was helpful to you. Appreciate you guys tuning in, we'll do another one of these soon.